That is what I hope, and, and it really is very simple because if you simply ask yourself, what would love do now every time you have to make a choice, and then you do whatever the answer to that question is, that, then you won't need a lot of the challenges that have been planned as potentials in your life blueprint. Absolutely. What would love do now? What would love do now? Yeah. As I understand it, Earth is literally the most difficult place in our universe on which to have an incarnation. Uh, and only the most courageous of beings come here. There are many, many beings who know there would be value in coming here. They don't have the courage to do that. The fact that you are in a body on planet Earth at this time makes you automatically among the most courageous beings in the universe. So honor yourself for having the courage to be here. Love yourself for the courageous being who you really and truly are. Beautiful. Thank you so much. You got to accentuate the positive. Wow! I feel good. A little bit of feel good goes a long way. You're listening to Karen Swain, teacher of deliberate creation, accentuating the positive, showing you a way to a better life. Accentuating the positive, it's not just bad, it's sanity. Who in their right mind would accentuate anything else? If you feel like that's what you want to do. Hello and welcome to another show, Accentuating the Positive with Karen Swain. So wonderful to be with you again. Remember, if you enjoy our shows, to like and subscribe on the YouTube and leave your comments or your uh, critiques on iTunes or any of the platforms you're listening to. Do I have another incredible, enlightened man to introduce you to today? I'm sure many of you have seen Robert before. Robert Swartz, welcome to the show. Thank you, Karen. It's a pleasure to be here with you. You know, I really feel like your work is so important. I just love what you're doing on the planet. And um, we're, we're going to get into your journey, but let me just read your bio for people who haven't met Rob, Robert, Rob before. Rob Schwartz is a hypnotist who offers between life soul regressions to help people heal and understand their life plan. His first book, Your Soul's Plan, Discovering the Real Meaning of the Life You Planned Before You Were Born, explores the pre-birth planning of physical illness, having disabled children, deafness, blindness, drug addiction, alcoholism, the death of a loved one, and accidents. In addition to the subject of pets, his second book, Your Soul's Gift, the healing power of the life you planned before you were born explores the pre-birth planning of spiritual awakening, miscarriage, abortion, caregiving, abusive relationships, sexuality, adoption, rape, incest, poverty, and mental illness. Rob's mission is to make empowering healing information about the pre-birth planning and the planning of life challenges available to as many people as possible. So that's what we're doing today. Hopefully there's a few more people watching today that hadn't heard your work before. Thanks again Thank for you. being on the show. Thanks for having me. I'm very happy to be here. So you didn't start out doing this. You were like many people I speak to on the show in the corporate world and earning lots of money you had an mba and working in marketing do you want to just take us briefly through your journey of discovering this work and how you found your mission in life i'd be happy to do that uh, as you said i have an mba i was in the corporate sector for a number of years basically doing different forms of corporate marketing and communications and i found this work to be very very unfulfilling <laughs> you know i used to tell people at the time I had the feeling if I fell off the face of the earth, my clients would hardly even notice I was gone. They would just plug somebody else into that role and carry right along. <laughs> but at the same time, I had the feeling that there was some kind of purpose or calling to my life. I just didn't know what it was, and I wasn't even sure how to figure out what it was. So when I had this existential crisis, which was back in 2003, I did some very conventional things to try to figure it out. I went for career counseling. I talked to all my friends and family. None of these things really told me what I should be doing with my life. And so uh, almost on a lark, I decided I would go have a session with a psychic medium. I wasn't even sure if I believed in mediumship, but I thought, why not? You know, I'll spend an hour, a little bit of my time, and we'll see what happens. Mm 
So I did this on May 7 of 2003. And I remember the date, Karen, because this was really the day on which my life changed. The medium started by introducing me to the concept of spirit guides, which I had actually never even heard of at the time. And she explained that a guide is a highly evolved non-physical being with whom we plan our lives before we come to body and who then guides us through our lives after we get here. And through this particular medium, I was actually able to talk with my guides. Now, they said a lot of amazing things to me that day, one of which was they said, you planned your life, including your biggest challenges, before you were born. And I'll tell you, I just shook my head and I said, well, why in the world would I have done that? And they said, you did this for purposes of spiritual growth. Now, I probably would have dismissed all of this as some kind of delusion on my part, except that the guides knew what all of my challenges had been without me telling them anything. So as you can imagine, if you're talking to beings who know everything about you without you saying anything, it gives them a lot of credibility. And they were able to tell me in some detail why I had wanted those challenges before I was born. Well, this session rocked my world. I mean, when that was over, I thought about this constantly for weeks afterwards. Mm -hmm. And it really brought about um, a change in my life. I left the corporate world and I thought, I'm onto a concept here that can really help people. And that was when I started researching the first book, which became Your Soul's Plan. You know, a couple of things. Was that your first, is that the first medium that you went to? Like you got a good one from the get-go, like you didn't try a few different ones? You know, the only experience I had with a medium prior to that was when I was a teenager. My cousin had a birthday party at which they hired a, a quote-unquote medium. I'm not sure how much ability she actually had. Mm. Uh, but she did say something interesting. She said, a lot of people will know your name someday. And I thought, well, she probably says that to everybody. Uh, <laughs> but it did turn out, you know, through the books that, that my work has become somewhat well known. Um, but in regard to your question, you know, I had, had looked at this woman's website and I had a good intuitive feeling about her. Uh, but I had never worked with any other medium before. I really yeah. did not have any personal recommendations for her. I just went on an intuitive hit and it worked out very well. For a corporate guy in marketing, you, you have a fairly strong, well, you did then, and I'm sure that it's expanded, said an intuitive uh, connection. Like you're, you're yeah, because a lot of us who, well, not me, because I was never in the corporate world, but are people that are, dismiss their, dismiss their intuition as, you know, imagination, silly thought, like going to a medium to a corporate guy must have seemed like a silly thought. Well, you know, my analytic mind was saying, what are you doing? And you're never going to figure out your purpose or your calling in life by going to a medium. But it just yeah. felt like the right thing to do. And it really had no downside. I mean, if she had said nothing useful, uh, there would be no harm come from it. So I thought, why not? And, uh, but it turned out to be a, a life-changing one hour. Uh, it sent me in a completely di different direction in life. So how old were you at that time? Well, I'm almost 57 now, so that's 16 years ago. So I would have been 40 at that time. All right, 40. Yeah, so your life, yeah, it's interesting because I've spoken to so many people on the show who have this massive wake-up call and then, and they live a lot like Garnet. Have you seen, heard of Garnet, Garnet Schulhauser? I'm sure you've heard I, of Actually, I know, I know him personally. Yeah, yeah. Well, a yeah. lot of what you say dovetails. You know, a lot of what Garnet's experienced, you know, through his astral, talking to his guide, talk, is, right. is exactly what you say. So it's great to have that collaboration between uh, spirit guides, I suppose, because you're talking to spirit guides. So this medium that you went to, are you still in contact with her now? What was her name? Uh, Laura Scott. Uh, I have not had any contact with her since then. People write to me occasionally and ask, who is this medium that you refer to in yeah. your books? Uh, and then I give out her name, but I, I have not worked with her since then. Oh, okay. Interesting. Okay. So what happened next? You started to think about constantly, we've planned our life. I, I, was it personal? Like, were you thinking, what did I plan? What did I plan for myself? Was it more of a personal journey you wanting to know about yourself? It started off that way. Uh, and that was certainly the information that the guides gave me through Laura. They were talking about my particular challenges. But as I took in this information in the weeks after the session, 
the effect that it had on me was that it, it produced a deep healing because previously I had not seen any deeper meaning to those challenges. It just felt like random, arbitrary, purposeless suffering to me. And so, of course, when those things happened, the fact that I saw no deeper meaning and it actually made the suffering worse. But through this conversation with my guides, through Laura, then I saw deep meaning in all the major challenges I had faced, and that created a, a profound healing for me. And that was really when I started to think about writing a book. I thought I'm on to a concept here that can bring a similar kind of healing to other people, and I would like very much to do that if I can. And that set me on the path to writing Your Soul's Plan and Your Soul's Gift. Do you want to share some of the challenges that you went through that turned around when you understood that you... Um... Planning. Yeah, I, I don't mind at all. The, the big one was that I grew up in an, a, a very abusive family environment, primarily from my mother. Um, there were a couple instances of what would now be considered physical abuse, but nothing really severe. But the emotional abuse was quite intense, and it went on constantly for a number of years until finally when I was 16, uh, my parents separated. I moved out with my father. So prior to this session with the guides, I had never seen any deeper meaning in that at all. I thought it was a horrible experience uh, and served no constructive purpose whatsoever. But through the work that I have done, uh, I've come to understand that um, there are a couple of things going on here karmically. One is I've had some past lives in which uh, I didn't have the courage to speak my truth. One of them was in Atlantis. I was a citizen there, opposed to what the government was doing, but afraid to speak out. There was a similar lifetime in Nazi Germany where I was a German citizen, again, opposed to what the Nazis were doing, but afraid to speak out. So when I saw those two lifetimes in my life review, I thought I would like to practice uh, being courageous and speaking my truth. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the reasons I chose this particular mission in my pre-birth planning, because what I'm saying that things like rape and incest are planned by souls before they were born, that, that is not an easy idea to put forward, yeah. uh, particularly as a man. It would be different if I were a woman who had experienced those things, but I'm a right. man and I have not had those experiences. Right. So this um, tests me to speak my truth. The other thing that I think is going on there as I understand from the conversations with my guides, is that I've had a number of lives in which uh, I really did not love myself very much and did not succeed in cultivating self-love. And so my current lifetime and the abuse that I experienced as a child, this is what I refer to as the learning through opposites life plan. In other words, I planned to experience this profound lack of compassion in my nuclear family in the hope that it would give me the opportunity and the motivation to go within cultivate self-compassion, cultivate self-love, and then some years later, having done so, take that compassion and that love and turn it outward in some form of service to others, which is the books and the workshops and the sessions that I do now. Yeah, beautiful. You know, your, um, the cats come to say hello. Hello. Uh, your, um, you're not speaking your truth in another life and, and being scared in this life and cultivating self-love and acceptance is, as somebody who activates and accelerates the New World Teachers, it, it seems to be a common story with many light weavers or teachers, people that are sharing this fear of being persecuted for what they're going to say. Um, it, it just seems to be, it seems to be a common collective thought form, even though everyone's had different past lives if you like or different soul plans do you think it's something that we all took on in order to overcome i think many many people have taken that on i, I don't want to say everybody and i don't have any sense of what percentage of the population is working on that particular lesson but i think it is a very common lesson at this time and certainly in the private sessions i do which are between lives regressions in which the clients find out what they planned before they were born we learned that a lot of people are working on that particular lesson. Yeah. Well, not the main, you know, populace, like the main people that are not sort of awakening to their spiritual purpose as some sort of facilitator or teacher within the consciousness arena. Uh, but, 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 but people in that, you know, category seem to have this fear of, it was definitely mine uh, as well. Like as a child, 
even talking to an adult used to make me cry. I was so shy. And then like you, I had uh, psychics come up to me and say, you're going to be standing in front of lots of people. And I'm like, that's never going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> it's just never going to happen. So in my 30s, I figured if that's going to happen, I need to put myself in front of people and get just get over it, just get over this whole shyness thing. Were you shy to stand in front of people or was it just speaking your truth? No, I, I was and actually still am shy to stand in front of people. On the Myers-Briggs scale, I'm an extreme introvert. I'm all the way at the far end of the introversion scale. I much prefer listening over talking, which is ironic given the amount of public speaking I do today. Right. I get nervous before every interview, like this one. I get nervous before every workshop I do. Uh, but you know, the, there's that Nike commercial, I don't know if you have it in Australia, where their motto is just do it. So I just say to myself, well, just do it, you know, feel the fear and do it anyway and, and uh, don't let it get in the way. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I have to say I don't get nervous anymore, but uh, there's something about the nervousness and feeling the fear and doing it anyway, and then com and, and accomplishing what you're fear what you're fearful of. That's really fulfilling and exhilarating. So you can look at it as a positive thing rather than a negative thing. It is fulfilling and exhilarating, uh, but I, you know, even more so. Uh, the thing that motivates me is that I hear from so many people by email who read the books or in person at the workshops, people will come up and say, thank you for this experience. It was life changing. And what they're referring to at the workshops is that we do a group between lives regression as part of the, the weekend. The people come out of that who previously had no idea what their pre-birth plan is. Now they have, in many cases, a very, very detailed idea of what they planned. Uh, and also how they're doing in terms of fulfilling the plan and how they can better fulfill it. And that changes people's lives. And every time I hear a comment like that, uh, I know that I'm on the right path. I know that I want to do this, even if I do get nervous giving talks in public. Yeah. So finding out that you planned your abusive childhood uh, had a profound healing on you. Did you go to your parents and like thank them physically? I have not done that. My well, my father passed away about eight years ago. Right. Uh, he he was a very very mainstream person and a very logical analytic person. Mm -hmm. So when he found out what I was writing in my books, uh, his first comment was that he he just had no idea what to make of it, <laughs> uh, and he was concerned that that I would never be able to support myself writing right. books on this subject. Right. Uh, then he found out that that was not the case. And, and then he said to me, well, it looks like you know something about a subject that I know nothing about. So then he, he opened up a little bit to it. And uh, what was most touching to me toward the end of his life, when uh, it was clear that he only had a number of days left, I was working on my second book at that time. And I took in the rough drafts and read portions to him. Uh, and he found it to be very comforting, especially uh, the fact that there is an afterlife. And we would talk about how, uh, you know, I'd say to him, well, your sisters and brothers will be there to greet you as you cross over. And he said, I sure hope that's true. Mm -hmm. So it, it was something that, that I, he opened up to more and more as life went on. Now, my mother, uh, she has, um, I don't know if she could be diagnosed, but in my opinion, has some serious mental illness. Right. And has suffered a lot. I don't want to add to her suffering. So I would not go to her and try to discuss this because my sense is that she really does not remember a lot of what happened. I think she right. repressed it. Yeah. And I have no idea to, no desire to traumatize her in any way. So she knows what the books are about. She has skimmed them. Uh, but uh, we have not discussed in any meaningful way what our plan is with each other. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I mean, we don't have to discuss like we, we planned all this, but um, just say, you know, thanks, Mum. Thanks for playing your part. <laughs> well, she played her part very well. And I, I'll tell you, if, if she had not played it so well, I would not be doing what I'm doing today. Absolutely. You know, when I discovered this, I had an abusive childhood as well. I think that's another common theme amongst healers or light weavers is they choose a lot of contrast within their family environment in order to give birth to desires of healing and understanding. 
And so like many, I had an abusive childhood too. And at some point in my 30s, I think, and I was coming to the understanding that I created all of it. Like I planned it, I created all of it. And just like a, a, a director or a producer or a script writer would script in the characters in the play of my life. And then what we do as humans is that we, when people play their part so well, we give them Academy Awards, right? And so I sat up in bed one night thinking about all the people that had played their parts in my uh, movie, of the movie of my life, and, you know, boyfriends who had hurt me and all the people. And, you know, I gave out Academy Awards to them in my mind according to how well they played their part in that how they convinced me that they didn't love me. And the best actor award went to dad. You know, he got the pinnacle because <laughs> he was the one that was beating me up as a child and convincing yeah. me that he didn't love me. But um, I did all that forgiving and everything and went to him personally when I was young because I just needed to let go of the angst. So I actually asked for his forgiveness, even though he was the abuser, because I just needed to let it go. And... Um, we were talking about this online the other day. This is what I do with a lot of my clients. You know, <laughs> they take responsibility for what they've created in their life. And when you take back your responsibility, you take back your power. So right. I think the work you're doing is just amazing. Thank you. All right. So where do we go from here? There's so many questions. I've asked a few people uh, if they had questions for you. A little quote that I, I took from your book here or I haven't actually read the whole book so I didn't have time, unfortunately. I wish I did, but just... On your website, you've got quite a few big excerpts from the books and I had a read of those. When we resist any aspect of life, we resist healing. I thought that was a great quote out of your book. You know, that is a very important concept for people to understand because whenever you are in resistance to a life challenge or anything at all in your life, you're giving a big energetic no to the universe. The universe doesn't understand that you intend to say no in regard to one specific experience. It just hears no, and it takes it as a global no to all the blessings you want in your life. It takes it as a no to physical health, a no to love, a no to spiritual clarity, a no to abundance. This is why in my second book I wrote, when there's a block in one direction, there's a block in every direction. I was talking about the effect of resistance. So when you understand how important resistance is, how important it is to minimize it, then you understand the value of free birth planning because that is a great way to reduce your resistance to your challenges. Okay, so let's, let's stretch this out a bit because this is a big one. What you resist persists. So what you're saying is life's throwing stuff at you and you're saying, no, I don't want that. Or people say, no, I don't want that. But in fact, your soul has said, I have written this challenge into the script of your life because you said you wanted to experience it. So instead of saying no, say, okay, bring it on and then see where it goes from there. Is that what you're saying? More or less, you want to get yourself to the place of least resistance. It's pretty difficult for the average person to go from a resounding no to bring it on. That's a big, <laughs> that's a big energetic leap. But you can do it in smaller stages. Uh, if you just look for the gift in the challenge, and that's what my books are all about, the gift in certain specific challenges, that will reduce some of the resistance. Another great way to reduce resistance, and you don't have to believe in pre-birth planning to do this, is just to think about anything at all that you're grateful for. Because the vibration of gratitude is fundamentally incompatible with the vibration of resistance. You cannot be in a state of gratitude and a state of resistance at one and the same time. It's just not possible. So if you want to reduce your resistance, if you want to cut down on the no you're giving to the universe, Think about anything at all that you're grateful for. And that's the great thing about gratitude is that the vibration of gratitude is the vibration of gratitude. It doesn't matter what the gratitude is in regard to. So if you don't have anything big, positive happening in your life, think about how beautiful the sound of a bird chirping is. Or feel gratitude for the way the breeze kisses your skin as it blows. 
or the way the sunshine feels on a warm, sunny day. You can feel gratitude in regard to anything, and that reduces that vibration of resistance. Absolutely. Absolutely. But, you know, I think that if can we feel grateful, and I think your books do this or your work does this, because this is definitely where I went, can we be grateful for all the traumas that we've been through? I mean, you've reached a point where you're grateful that you had an abusive childhood, right, that your mother was maybe mentally not great and she didn't treat you so well and that you had sceptical parents because out of that you grew. Uh, what, what did you experience from that? Like how did you grow from that experience? I, I think it gave me a lot of empathy, uh, right. a lot of kindness, a lot of compassion. Right. There, were, there, were, there were tremendous blessings that came out of that. Right. So can we be grateful for all the crap as well as the bird singing? <laughs> that's that's where we be. need to go. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Can we can. So that, therein lies the challenge to find the gratitude for all of it and not just the good things. You know, don't just focus on the great things to be grateful for, but, but can we find the gratitude in all of it in the past? And can we find the gratitude in the moment that we're experiencing death, disease, divorce, depression. There's a beautiful healer here called Patria King. She calls them the, the four Ds, death, divorce, depression, <laughs> disease. <laughs> Can we be grateful for that as well? What's it teaching me? What am I learning? How am I changing as a person? Cultivating more compassion, more connection, more uh, empathy, as you say. Okay, so uh, Camilla put, has a question here. Can you please ask Robert, if he has researched why after a coma, the memory can be lost, does the soul still connect with mine? I feel telepathy has been the way to communicate. Does he believe in the term walk-ins? Uh, so there's a couple of questions here. Let's talk about the coma. Have you had any uh, information on why memory can be lost after people come out of a coma? Um, I have not researched that specifically. Uh, in regard to the walk-in question, the memory is preserved, uh, as I understand it. And we should probably explain here what a walk-in is. Okay. Um, a walk-in occurs when the soul that is in a particular body decides that either it's learned everything it came to learn or it will not be able to learn everything it came to learn. In either case, it's time to go home. Now, normally, the, bo the physical body would cease to function at that point. But there's another soul on the other side whose learning does not require going through infancy or childhood. So that soul's attitude, and I, I don't mean to sound facetious, but that soul's attitude is, let's not waste time. I'll start off in an adult body. So a walk-in is often staged during an accident or an illness, and it's often an illness that creates a coma. When the coma begins, the original person is in the body, then their soul walks out, the walk-in soul comes in. And we've all heard stories like this where uh, the family talks about how their loved one was in a coma and then when they came out of it, their personality was completely different. And they say things like, it's almost as though he or she is a different person. Well, that's literally true. He or she is a different person, but they have the memories of the original soul that was in the body. He says that the personality is completely different. Uh, and that is a very, very difficult path to walk because you have to navigate these relationships that were established by a different soul. And you have qualities, characteristics that are completely different from that soul. So it's a time of great upheaval and turmoil and a, a very, very difficult road. Yeah, I have. Yeah, I have quite a few friends that have taken that path, and watching them navigate that, and um, and relating to their family of birth, you know, because they seem so different. But anyway, uh, but also what can happen is that a different aspect of your soul can walk in. So if we're if we're a soul, you know, where the soul is greater than the personality we're perceiving right now and we're living all our lives simultaneously. So there are different aspects of us, you know, out there doing other things that we dovetail with in this life. Maybe there's a part of us that's 
in spirit or finish their incarnation. I, I, it's hard to talk about this because we always talk about linear time when we're speaking from this perspective and it's not linear. But maybe a, another part of us walks in as well to experience this life. That can happen too, right? That can happen. That's something that, you know, is really beyond my area of expertise. I come across walk-ins in, in the research I do for the books and in the private sessions, but it's not something that I have really focused on quite a bit. I will share one interesting tidbit about walk-ins, though. There's a famous one that your uh, audience will know about, and that is Saddam Hussein. As I understand it, toward the end of the war with Iraq, Hussein was walking along a riverbank in Iraq, this was shortly before he was about to be captured. His soul walked out. Another soul walked into his body knowing that shortly thereafter he would be captured, imprisoned, tried, convicted, and put to death. Now think about that. Why would a soul want to walk into a situation like that? Tremendously challenging. But think about all the things that you could learn in a situation like that. Acceptance, faith, trust self-reliance, self-love, compassion, and on and on and on. It's a phenomenal learning opportunity. The soul that walked into Hussein's body, as I understand it, was a tremendously high vibrational soul. There was a lot of support on the other side for what this soul was doing. Uh, there was an interesting moment, apparently, when uh, someone from one of the American intelligence agencies was sent to interview Hussein in his jail cell, and this person came back to the U.S. and did an interview on a TV show called 60 Minutes that's popular here. Uh, and he said in the interview, I couldn't believe what I was seeing. Hussein was calm, peaceful, quiet, soft-spoken. He was writing poetry in his jail cell. It's almost as though he was a different person. What? Well, he was. He was a different person. Wow. That's fascinating, Rob. So where that information came from one of your... One of the uh, channels. Channels. Wow, that's fascinating. Yeah. I've always, oh, I'm not going to go into it, but I've always had thoughts about Hussein not being the monster that the mainstream media made him out to be, and actually didn't really predicate much of the stuff that we've that said that he did. So uh, he was a bit of a scapegoat, I think. For um, anyway, but I'm not going to go into that. But that's fascinating. That's really fascinating. Yeah. Wow. Okay. And in, in your books, you talk about money and soul planning. So I've been one of these people and there are a lot of people I know who like plan to make a lot of money, <laughs> you know, and try their hardest, try their darndest and never, it never happens for them. Do you want to talk about what uh, is going on there with some of the people, why they plan that? Well, there, there are a couple of things going on there. Some of that is restrictions that are put into place in the pre-birth plan. Uh, for example, there are many people who have planned for one reason or another to experience poverty or a lack to some degree. Uh, and if that's the structure that's put in place for part of your lifetime, or perhaps even all of it, then those are the limitations that you as the personality are dealing with. You can't go outside the framework of the pre-birth plan. Within the plan itself, you have tremendous uh, flexibility to make free will decisions, but there are limitations or borders around the plan that you as the personality simply can't go beyond unless the plan is amended at the soul level. Uh, the other thing that is happening there, I think it's largely a matter of vibration. Uh, you know, Edgar Casey said, mind is the builder. And it is. Many people are thinking low vibrational thoughts. They believe in lack. They believe in scarcity. They have other false beliefs like the money has to come through work and you right. have to work hard in order to get the money. Right. Well, if you believe that, that will be your reality. The world will always mirror your beliefs back to you. Once you give up false beliefs like that and you understand that abundance is your birthright as a divine being, then it comes much more readily. Yeah. Okay. So this is how I wanted to talk about how pre-birth planning and law of attraction dovetails because let's just use money. People love talking about money as, as, as something. So, so say you've come in to learn to be a healer and a teacher and not to put your focus on the material world. And so you've set it up that even though people around you would have a lot of material stuff, you wouldn't because you wanted to 
hone your focus into more in like you know talking to your guides or getting more inward focus rather than outward focus get too distracted with all the bells and whistles of the physical world you know travel and shoes and (laughs) restaurants and blah 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 so no matter how hard you try you can't make any money because that's not your plan even though the world is telling you be successful make money buy lots of clothes (laughs) you know have a big house go on holidays and so you're trying to fit into this world but it's not happening for you so you do law of attraction courses and you try and vibe abundance and it still doesn't happen to you so how is the pre-birth planning and law of attraction working together here well there's a very elegant intricate intersection between the two uh again you have to you you cannot go beyond the boundaries that are imposed by the pre-birth plan unless it is amended after you've come into body but you have flexibility and free will within the boundaries of the plan So if your plan, for example, is to be a healer, uh, your higher self will see to it that you always have enough income to continue as a healer for whatever portion of your life you planned to be a healer. You will have that. Uh, If you want to go far beyond that and do the restaurants and the big house and the trips and the shoes and all of that, uh, then if it's not part of the plan, uh, thinking certain thoughts to magnetize those sorts of things to you is not going to be very successful and you'll be frustrated and and you'll think of yourself as a failure most likely until you start to understand that there are other things that you can learn from those limitations Uh, it shifts your priorities it forces you to go within and become more self-referencing it forces you to focus on things that you have control over like Uh, How well do you treat yourself? How much love do you cultivate for yourself? How much love do you give and receive in your relationships with other people? That really is the bottom line reason why we're here. We're learning lessons in how to give and receive love. So when you get to your life review at the end of the lifetime, you're not going to care that you didn't have a lot of shoes or a big house, but you will very much be concerned about how you did in terms of giving and receiving love. If you know that while you're in body, then you can focus on that while you're here uh, and hopefully have a very satisfying life, even if you don't have a lot of money. Right. Beautiful. Yeah. So, you know, Esther Hicks, the teachings of Abraham, I'm sure you know these teachings. Yeah, sure. You know, talk about, well, if you vibrationally align with something, you can manifest anything you want. So, from that understanding a lot of people think okay i can get anything i want if i vibrationally align with it but she doesn't bring in this concept of pre-birth planning at least not that i know of maybe she has now i don't know i haven't heard her speak for quite a few years so we have to take that into account right that maybe there's something that i really 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 want but maybe my soul says that's not what you're here to do you know that's just society telling you you must have you know you should want it because we're like bombarded with these messages from mainstream media and you know make lots of money be successful go on holidays and all that sort of thing so um we have to take into account that maybe there's another lesson and even if mm -hmm, go on well i was going to say that there's an analogy or metaphor that is uh, sometimes used to understand this and that is of a, a video game in which uh, you are the avatar, whatever the avatar may be. And uh, it's, the game is like a pyramid with ascending levels. You start the avatar on the ground level, and your objective is to get the character to move up to the top of the pyramid, the highest level. And as you're going across these different levels, uh, you're attacked by different monsters and demons and so forth, and you have to do other things to move the avatar up. Yeah. Well. Within the structure of the software of the video game, you have total control over the avatar. You can use the joystick to go left or right or up or down or jump over the demons that are attacking you, whatever it might be. But you can't get the avatar to do something that's not already pre-programmed into the software. You can't have it jump off the screen and materialize in three dimensions in front of you. That's not part of the programming. So the limitations of the software in the video game are similar to the limitations of the pre-birth plan. 
you can't do something that those limits won't allow you to do. Unless you learn the lesson. So maybe you had been, you know, in a past life, a rich person that abused his power and money was your focus and you had no compassion for the poor and you were a rich landholder and, and had slaves or whatever. You know, I'm just making it up. And then in this life, you come into a wealthy family who loses all their money and then you spend the rest of your life poor and you're looking to make that money again because society says make money, make money. And then you learn compassion and you learn. And so maybe when you learn those lessons, then you can achieve that goal, right? Is that right? That, that, that is a very good point. Uh, you know, people ask me all the time, is there some way I can avoid or sidestep whatever challenges I <laughs> plan for myself? Ah! And the, the answer actually, uh, often, not always, but often the answer is yes, if you learn the underlying lessons right. on your own through your free will choices. Uh, but in order to do that, you have to, number one, know what the lessons are. Most people don't know what lessons they're working on. And then number two, you've got to find a way to learn it without going through the experiences that were planned to challenge you. Uh, and that may not necessarily be an easy thing to do. Yeah. You know, money's on my mind at the moment because I just read on the weekend that there's this a tech, a very young man here in Australia, a tech millionaire, billionaire, billionaire. I didn't think Australians had too many billionaires. I don't actually read the mainstream paper but somebody brought it to my attention, who brought a house here for $100 million. And then he bought the house next door for a few more $100 million or something. Anyway, <clears throat> and I'm sort of looking at this sort of wealth thinking, what is his life plan? You know, to have that much wealth at such a young age. But people don't realize that having a lot of money can actually be more challenging than having no money. And there's well, that that's what people with a lot of money say frequently. Right. Uh, and the, the life plan is not to have a lot of money just so you can have big houses and enjoy yourself and party for the rest of your lifetime. There are lessons that go with that, learning how to use money and power responsibly in service to others right. with love. Uh, those are challenging lessons. Yeah. Yeah. I came from a wealthy family uh, and my dad lost all his money, but I watched, I watched him and his siblings squabble over the money. And um, my father didn't speak to his brother for 30 years because when his mother died, she had left them both a beautiful old Rolls Royce. It's a, that's a classic car now. It's a beautiful old, you know, old twenties or thirties. I can't remember, but one of the old ones. And my dad couldn't afford to buy my brother out, his brother out. And so because of that, he didn't speak to him for 30 years. And it just makes me shake my head over something as silly as that. And on his deathbed, he went to the hospital and said, you know, oh, hi, I haven't spoken to you for 30 years. And I'm like, took you 30 years over something as stupid as a car? It's just crazy, isn't it? How, anyway, I'm sure they'll be, doing some more plans. They're both gone now. So be doing some more plans around the whole money thing. But I saw money just destroy the relationships within his family. And uh, it wasn't, yeah, having money didn't help them, help any of them, in fact. So it was interesting. Okay, more questions here. Mm -hmm. Yep, go on. I was going to say they, they may very well plan to be extremely wealthy in their next incarnation Maybe. in order to uh, attempt to learn the same lessons and get it right this time. Yeah, exactly, exactly. I think that uh, Garnet spoke about in one of his sojourns on the other side, watching a pre-birth planning session. And the person who was planning was planning to come in as, as a son or a daughter of a tech millionaire because they had had money a few times in a past life. And then their guides had said to them, maybe you don't come in as their son or daughter, maybe come in as their gardener. Cause again, that I, think I the, remember that. Do you remember that? Yeah. 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 And the, the purpose of being the gardener was that uh, they were going to endure a lot of verbal abuse from coworkers. And I think perhaps the family itself. And the thinking was, you'll learn more from that than just being the son or daughter of billionaires. Yeah. It's so fascinating. This stuff. So fascinating. Uh, okay, 
you spoke with people who remembered their soul planning, who had illnesses in their lives. When you were first setting out, when you had this idea, you know, I'm going to speak with people who remembered their life plan. Who remembers their life plan apart from people that are going to psychics or mediums or, or who are mediums? Do people spontaneously there, remember? There are very few people who remember their pre-birth planning. And the ones who do have memory, it's, it's a very partial, hazy memory. I, I don't think I've met anybody who has a strong, detailed recollection of the pre-birth planning. Uh, when I first started to research pe people's pre-birth plans for my first book, I assumed incorrectly that there would be people in the world who would have a detailed recall of their pre-birth planning. And that was my first attempt to, to research the book. I went onto the internet, which was new at that time. I went to every spirituality bulletin board I could find. And I posted a notice saying, author writing a book about how we plan our lives before we're born. If you remember planning your life, please contact me. Well, I got thousands of emails from people all over, over the world, but not a single one of them remembered planning their current <laughs> lifetime. They, they were writing in with uh, memories of past lives on Earth, right. past lives on other planets, non-physical mm -hmm. lifetimes, all kinds of very interesting things. But nobody in that group remembered planning the current lifetime. Right. Yeah, so it's set up that way, right, that we're not supposed to remember. Sure. Yeah. I guess that as we live our life, we can look back and we can see that we've planned that. Like I have a, a friend and a client in my online group whose husband's just, I call it drop the body because, you know, I, I've had so many people that have died. Mum dies when I'm 16. Best friends died. They just keep dropping along the way. And so they kept coming back to me saying, you know, there's no such thing as death. So I never say died. I always say drop the body. And she was saying online the other day, that even though she's grieving and her kids are grieving because he was young and they're young, you know, in their 40s, she knows that she planned it this way and uh, that she knows that it was all planned. Like, I, I know that I planned this. I know that I planned that. So she's right in the middle of the whole scenario, but she, she's, have, she's, she's in that realisation that she's planned it this way, um, which is quite beautiful to see really because she's been on her spiritual path for a few years now and she's been exploring all this stuff. So she's in the thick of life and it's most juicy and, but she knows she's planned it. I don't know if it makes it better. Maybe it makes it easier, but it doesn't make the grief go away really. No. And it's very important to still allow yourself to feel the emotions. You, you don't want to use the pre-birth planning to intellectualize the things that you go through. If you don't process the emotions, uh, you'll end up being physically ill at some point until you do. But the real value of the pre-birth planning, I think, is that it pulls you out of victim consciousness. So right. the person you were talking about, for example, if she had never heard of the concept of pre-birth planning and one person after another after another drops the body, she's probably going to go into victim mentality and feel like God or the universe is punishing her. Mm -hmm. uh, but if she knows that she planned it, it will keep her out of victim consciousness. Victim consciousness, as I understand it, is literally the single lowest frequency a human being can be at. And it tends to be self-perpetuating because if you believe yourself to be a victim, you're stating energetically to the universe that you are a victim. Well, whatever energetic statement you make to the universe, it always says, yes, that's right, you are. So if you state energetically to the universe that you're a victim, yeah. it says, yes, you are a victim, and it brings you more experiences that seem to confirm to you that you are a victim. The way to break out of that is simply to understand that you're the powerful soul who planned these experiences. It's so enlightening, Rob. It's just so enlightening. Just You just take back your power. If I created this, if I planned this, then I can plan something else. You know, what else can I plan? Because as you say, okay. they're not set in stone, right? So you plan before you come. But if you wake up and you have these realizations while you're here, then you can amend them like so I've got all these challenges that I still haven't learned yet but I've got the lessons the lesson that I wanted to learn from those challenges I've already received so now I can change the plan yeah that's that's just it a lot of times when people are new to the concept of pre-birth planning and they first hear about it they think it means that everything is set in stone right. that is not at all what it means most experiences are planned as potentials probabilities 
uh, and whether or not they actualize depend upon your free will decisions. There are some things that are set in stone, but not many. For example, if you choose to be born with a physical handicap that can't be treated by medical science, and you would know that going in, then short of what we call a miracle, you're going to have that physical handicap or your choice of parents. Once you're born, obviously you can't choose different parents at that point. But there are very few things like that that are set in stone. Most things, again, are set up as potentials. Yeah. You know, I had a girlfriend who died at 40 who was born, she was one of the people born under the thalidomide. Remember thalidomide? You're the same I age as me. Yeah. 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 So it was around our generation. And she, if she was alive, she'd be your age. And um, yeah, so uh, I started my spiritual journey really young. And most of the people I grew up with were not into it. But I hadn't seen her for years and I bumped into her in the street and she was sort of starting to read spiritual books. And so we got together again as friends and she was on her spiritual path because she was born, um, it was really interesting, she was born into a very beautiful, physically beautiful looking family. Her father was beautiful, her mother was beautiful and two other sisters who were stunningly beautiful. And then she's born with deformities, right? Physical deformities, although her face was very beautiful. She had one short arm and she had no thumbs, but most of her physical deformities were internal. The doctor said she wouldn't live past six, she wouldn't live past 16, she wouldn't live past you know, 20, she wouldn't live past... They kept killing her off and she kept living and smoking and drinking and having you know, affairs. Like She kept living, like really living, not just trying to survive, but really living life because she's like, I'm going to die soon, I'm just going to do what I like. <laughs> and she kept living. But I remember when we were having a spiritual discussion once, she said, you know, I've been told by some people that I must have been really mean in a past life to come in deformed in this life, which is not so, right? It, it was such a terrible thing to think. Like I must have been really horrible in a past life to, become in, to come in deformed in this life. What do you say about well, Karma is often conceptualized in that way as some kind of punishment. And that is really not at all what I've seen in my work. You're, you're not being punished by God or the universe or some being or counsel external to right. yourself. You see in your life review how you did in the past lives. And then if you feel you could have done better if you left certain lessons unlearned, then you yourself set up the challenges, but not as a punishment. You set it up as a, a learning opportunity, a continuation of what you were working on in past lives. Yeah. I actually, and I've heard you talk about this, that sometimes people come in, like the story, do you want to tell the story that um, the two rich women that went to see Edgar Cayce? That, sure. Yeah. So just a bit of background in case people aren't familiar with Casey. Uh, he's now back on the other side. Uh, many people regard him as the greatest American psychic medium who has ever lived. So late in Casey's career, uh, after he'd already read for thousands and thousands of people, he was visited by two wealthy women uh, from New York City, sisters. And the sisters said to him, Mr. Casey, we are at the end of our rope in regard to our brother. He lives under a bridge in New York. He drinks too much. We come from a wealthy family, but he long ago squandered his share of the family fortune. Over the years, we've tried everything we can think of to help him turn his life around, and nothing has worked. Mr. Casey, can you tell us anything that will help us help our brother? Well, upon hearing this, Casey did what he always did, which is he went into trance, he went into the Akashic record, which is the complete non-physical record of everything relevant to Earth, including the pre-birth planning. And then he said to the sisters, your brother is the single most highly evolved soul about whom I have ever obtained information. And the three of you planned before any of you were born for him to do exactly what he's been doing so that the two of you could learn to be more compassionate. Well, that was not the response they were hoping for, but that's how it works. But, you know, because we don't know as a society that this is what's going on, we tend to judge people like the brother when, in fact, the brother, in this case, is a very highly evolved soul who's coming in as a teacher to his sisters. Yeah, I love that story. It's such a beautiful story. And, you know, as I, as I think of my friend and, and the family, I believe she was a highly evolved soul that chose to come in as a, 
in with some deformity into a beautiful family to teach them about compassion and 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 loving and not to get so caught up with looking good you know like i got to tell you rob she had her work cut up for, <laughs> cut out for her <laughs> cuz they still were completely obsessed with beauty and looking good and success and fat. Like they were still, even though they had this, this sister that was this standing there, like showing them. Yeah. It's interesting. Her, when she left, when she dropped her body, her other sister, her, the second um, down. So she was the eldest. And then the next one, she actually dropped her body a few years later. And I was really confused about this and I had a chat with my guides and they said really she came in as a support system for Nikki who had taken on these challenges and the second sister, even though she was beautiful um, and intelligent, she was really there as, and she was very much her support system. And when she was no longer here, then her life had sort of finished its, its yeah. mission, if you like even though she had been at my house talking about how she wanted to get married and have children and make money and all that stuff that we're supposed to do. And I was like teaching her about law of attraction, how she could get everything she wanted. She goes and dies of a brain tumor. And I'm like, damn. But the, then I was told that that was all perfect as well. But the, the younger sisters left and now she's like 50 and she's all Botoxed up and, you know, right. fake boobs and everything. And she's, she's still, she hasn't got the lesson yet. It's, it's all about looking good and being famous and making money. It's so interesting. It's so interesting when you delve deeply into this work and what's really going on and not what we're supposed to be, you know, rich, famous, successful, happy, all that sort of stuff. Okay. Oh, I want to talk about pets. I want to talk about parallel lives. I want to talk about ETs and pl planning lives. But I've got here Hitler because I, I saw you say something about Hitler, which I thought was really fascinating. And it somewhat dovetailed with what somebody else had said about Hitler. I think um, someone asked you on another interview about group, um, do, do people like 6 million Jews, you know, died in the, Holocaust did they all plan that what did you discover about that I asked about Hitler early on in the research for my first book uh, this is not in either of my books I asked just out of personal curiosity yeah. and what I was told uh, believe it or not is that Hitler's pre-birth plan was to be a great spiritual leader and so his soul equipped him with certain gifts that were intended to facilitate that gifts of oratory and rhetoric and charisma. Uh, apparently there was a specific option in his pre-birth blueprint for him to use his artwork to spiritually inspire people. You might know he liked to paint and was apparently very good at it. But again, we all have free will. Hitler used his free will to go, uh, to deviate from his pre-birth plan about as much as any soul possibly can. So he took the gifts that were intended to make him a great spiritual leader and went off and did what he ended up doing. The other question that people always ask about Hitler is where is he, what happened to him? When I asked that question, I was told he's back on the other side, he's aware of what he did, and as a form of self-punishment, he's repeatedly recreating his death, which apparently was very painful. So it's important to emphasize here, he's not being punished by God or some being external to him. This is a self-inflicted punishment. He's loved unconditionally by God, just as all beings are. He's surrounded by loving guides and angels. Uh, presumably, they're beaming light to him. He probably doesn't perceive it, but eventually he will. Then he'll move into the light, and presumably at that point, he'll feel that he's got a lot of karma to balance, and he'll start incarnating again. Well, yeah, that's, I heard you say that on, on another show, and Garnet has actually had a chat with Hitler on the other side. I know. Yeah, and he's um, he's obviously finished. He 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 said that he had did go through what you talked about, again linear time. So there was a period or a moment or an experience that he did experience what you've spoken about, but that he is no longer doing that. And uh, he did say to Garnet that he would reincarnate to in into Earth to try and make up for some of the mistakes that he made, but. Surely all of it wasn't a mistake. I can't imagine that 
what happened was a, like it has to have been planned at some point, even though he didn't become the great spiritual leader in the eyes of many who revered him, he was a great leader, even though somewhat um, misguided. So surely all the gas you know, camps and everything and 6 million people died, that, none of that must have, been, must have been planned. Well, again, it depends on the definition of planned. If planned means foreseen as a potential, yeah. then uh, that probably is the case. Uh, it may have been foreseen as an unlikely potential, and certainly Hitler's soul's hope was that he would become this great spiritual leader. But as I understand it, Hitler had a, a very abusive childhood as well, and so it probably was foreseen that he could use his free will to respond to that challenge in a very negative way. Yeah, mm, I think there's more to this story, though. Because uh, many of the people that were killed in the gas camps have come back, you know, and and had amazing lives, you know, based on that past life. They've become lawyers for injustice and great artists and great healers. And I've got many friends here in Sydney who um, I had a, you know, a friend who was, I did a session with her and, and she always felt very connected because some of her family died in the camps. But I actually, my guides told her that she was actually a child and she died in the camps. And then she facilitates beautiful spiritual gatherings here in Sydney and, and she's created a, a huge community. And yeah, so based on that life, you know, great things have come out of it, you know, in, in other lives. So surely that must have been some plan. To me, it's I, I think the, the Holocaust is, is probably a very complex subject from a pre-birth planning standpoint. Right. Uh, and this is one of the reasons that I intentionally have not looked into it yet, because right. uh, I think it's something for me to do a, a bit later on. Oh, okay. Well, we'll get back to you, Rob. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> All right. What about pets? People love their pets. People plan lives with their pets. I know that you've spoken about a, um, a story that you have in your book about a little person, a dwarf, who, who chose. Do you want to speak about that? Yeah, the story in Your Soul's Gift is uh, about an American woman named Marsha who is four feet, eight inches tall in this lifetime. So she's a dwarf. Uh, yeah. And she chooses this in her pre-birth planning for reasons of her own. And then her guides say to her, you know, this is going to be extremely difficult, especially when you're a child. You'll be teased and ostracized by the other children. You need to put some supports in place to get yourself through this. And the route she chooses is to bring in all of her future pets into the pre-birth planning session. So there are dogs, there are cats, there's a horse, there's a uh, a rooster named Crooked Beak, and they all come into the pre-birth planning session and essentially say to her, uh, we will love you unconditionally and be the support that gets you through this very difficult challenge. And that's exactly the way it worked out. She had an extremely difficult time as a child at school, but then she would come home, jump on her horse, they would ride through the fields, the dogs and cats would love her unconditionally, the rooster loved her unconditionally, uh, so the supports are put in place for whatever challenges we plan. Yeah. So I remember hearing, I know you've been on Elisa's, uh, Elisa Medhus's show, and she says, you know, that Eric says that pets are gifts, like they're gifts. They're gifts to help you on this, in this challenging life. Um, this little thing next to me here has been with me three times, and I grew up in a family that had no pets. And I remember I went to see some reader who said, get a pet. And I'm like, why? Because it wasn't in my consciousness to get a pet because I grew up without any pets. And then cats kept coming to me. Like we were living in a house and there were these young people. I was young at the time too, 18, but there were these other people living next door that were um, smoking a lot of dope and they'd tie the cat's legs up and they would get a bong and then they'd blow the bong smoke and then watch this cat stoned walking with its legs tied up. Like they were torturing this cat. So anyway, we adopted the cat to save the cat, you know, so pets kept coming to me. And uh, yeah, black cats, I've had three black cats that have been the same soul. So that soul's obviously been in my life plan. Even when my last cat died at 20, I said, I'm not going to get another cat. Four weeks later, a little black kitten shows up in my car. <laughs> 
So it's in the plan, right? <laughs> if it's in the plan, you're going to have that cat, whether you go looking for him or not. I know. Don't you love it how that works? I just love it. All right. Uh, there was another story that you shared in another show that about a, a, the soul. The, okay, so people say, can, and I've had this because I've had somebody else on the show talk about souls and pets, and she said that the soul of a pet is usually a soul that's not as advanced as a human soul because they're having an easier life and so it's sort of easier to be a pet and then when they get a little bit more advanced with this third dimensionality and the struggles that we have here, then you move up to being a human soul. And I've had people online judge that and say, no, 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 my dog is a really advanced soul. I know it, I know it. But you have a story about that. So there's, again, leeway. It's not set in stone, this rule about pets and souls, advanced souls. Do you want to share that story about the... Well, well, I, I, I don't know if this is the story you're thinking of, but I, I have a personal friend who, uh, uh, a woman in this lifetime who planned for reasons of her own to be single this lifetime. Uh, and there were a couple other souls who had been with her in past lives, particularly one uh, as Native Americans. They wanted to be with her again, but she had this plan in place to be single. So even though they'd already had human lifetimes, uh, they decided they would come in as her pets, as a, a couple of dogs, and that was their route to being able to be with her once again. It was the only option. Yeah, and they were very intelligent, beautiful, healing dogs, I think I heard you say. In, in they, they were. Uh, the, this friend of mine is a healer, mm -hmm. and she would often bring the dogs into sessions with clients, and the dogs in their own way would contribute to the healing. Yeah. Isn't that beautiful? So nothing set beautiful. in stone, even though, because I think as humans, we look for the right and the wrong. Is it this or is it that? And it's like, yes, it's this and that. So you can be a human advanced soul and then take on an animal body, or you can be, you know, having never had a human life and take on an animal. Like it's, it's both, right? It doesn't have to be set in stone. It's both. I, I think that the much more common route is to be animal a number of times and then become human. Right. But there are these other options. There's options, always options. Okay, what about ET souls? ET ET's planning a human life. Have you delved into that? Uh, I have not looked at that too much. I, I know certainly that it happens. But, you know, when you say ET souls, it, it makes it sound almost as though those souls are different from non-ET souls. Yeah. Uh, that, okay. isn't, that isn't my understanding. Yeah, they, souls these are, are souls are souls. Yeah, souls are souls. You know, they may have started off somewhere else mm -hmm. uh, and then moved on to the Earth experience, but the, the, a soul is a soul. Yeah. So have you had any experience of a soul who's never had a, because I've met many of them incarnate that they, you know, one girl I had on the show, she called herself a first earther. Yeah. <laughs> so she had lived, her soul had lived more in other dimensions and other experiences and ha has come to earth to be a part of the shift and, and taken on a physical body. And um, have you had any experience with soul plannings of people like that? I can't think off the top of my head of somebody I met who was here as a, their first incarnation on Earth. But what I have seen quite a bit, especially in private between lives regressions with clients, uh, is that the person is what is sometimes referred to as a wanderer, meaning right. they come from a very far away place, usually a much more highly evolved society, and they've quote unquote wandered to earth. The characteristics of a wanderer are that they generally feel very out of place here. They think that uh, earth is a crazy place to be, that a lot of things that are going on here don't make any sense at all, Absolutely. which is certainly true from the perspective of a more evolved society. Yeah. They feel like they don't fit in. Uh, there's a wonderful channeled book on this subject called The Wanderer's Handbook by a, a channel named Carla Rukert, who returned to spirit herself a few years ago. And I always recommend that book to clients who are wanderers because it helps them understand who they are, why they came here, and mm -hmm. uh, what they can do to feel more at home here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What about yourself? Do you know, have you had any uh, experiences on other dimensions and other planets? I, I asked about this in, in one of the very early channeling sessions for the first book. Uh, the response that I got was that uh, I did come originally from some faraway place in the Pleiades, 
and I asked what the name of the planet was, and they said Kumargon, uh, which means nothing to me. Uh, I don't remember that name, uh, but that's, that's what I was told from a source that I consider to be reliable. Right. And how did that land with you? Uh, you know, it, it made sense because uh, I have often thought myself that a lot of what goes on here on Earth is crazy. Crazy. makes no sense at all. <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> when I was told that I come from a place that, that uh, might be more highly evolved, uh, that resonated as true. Yeah. yeah. You know, I asked my guides about you too because um, – I found your personality, I've, I've, I've understood a few more things about you having this conversation with you and, and that, that shyness, what did you say, that level of um, introversions yeah, right off the street. So I asked why you had this sort of quite um, steady personality, let me say, and, and I was thinking it's kind of like Mr. Spock on Star Trek. <laughs> <laughs> A bit like Mr. Spock on Star Trek. You know, not, the emotions don't go up and down. Like if you listen to me, up and down and up and down, and you're sort of more level. And they right. said to me, yeah, yeah, that's right, because uh, emotion for you is, um, from where you come from, is more stable. You know, humans, we're all over the place, but where you come from, it's much more <laughs> it's much lo more logical, like emotions connected with the intellect more. It's not so over the place and I think humans here are just they're so in their emotional body and screaming and yelling at people and laughing out loud and you know like <laughs> they don't have that logic connected to it so much that's what they told me about you <laughs> well that makes sense that, that, that resonates sense. for me it does yeah. we'll just call you Mr. Spock from now on. <laughs> 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 all righty what time is it we've been yakking for ages oh there's so much to say to you Rob you're just fascinating I wanted to talk about there's something you said about, oh, the tsunami in 2004. There was something that you were talking about. Do you remember what that was? I can't remember. I've, written, I've jotted it down as I was uh, watching some interviews with you. Well, the, the, a lot of people want to know about the pre-birth planning of large-scale events, right. uh, which for the most part is not a subject I have yet examined. But there is one event that I know something about, and that's the tsunami that hit Southeast Asia a number of years ago, in which you might remember 100,000 people or so yeah. were killed. I have asked about that. And my understanding is that those 100,000 or so souls uh, got together before they incarnated it, and they said, we would like the earth to be at a certain vibration, a certain frequency by a certain point in linear time. And if it looks as though the earth is not going to get there, then we agree to give our lives in a large-scale natural disaster because we know the result of that disaster will be this worldwide outpouring of love and compassion and support that will in turn elevate the frequency of the whole planet. Well, that's exactly what happened. After that tsunami hit Southeast Asia, you had all the governments of the world put aside their differences in order to funnel aid into Southeast Asia. And that coordinated uh, showing of love and compassion lifted the frequency of the entire planet. So those souls accomplished exactly what they planned to do. From the human perspective, it looks like a horrible tragedy. And from the human perspective, it is a horrible tragedy. But from the pre-birth planning perspective, the soul level perspective, uh, it was a great blessing and a great accomplishment. They did exactly what they set out to do. Mm. Oh, it's fascinating. So have you been told much about our future? because um, I've had quite a few people on the show that have spoken about it and that we're, you know, humanity. It's interesting that you say these souls wanted humanity to have shifted to a certain frequency. And if that didn't happen, then they were willing to sort of drop their bodies in order to bring, to hone this message of more connection, more compassion, more um, working together. What's in our future? What's, what's in our store for us? Uh, I've only been told very general things that, that we're moving uh, from the third dimension briefly through the fourth dimension and then into the fifth dimension and that the fifth dimensional experience will be one of oneness consciousness. Uh, and that's about all that I, has been shared with me. So right. Far. But how are we going to get there when we're still all fighting and focused on money and you know polluting the earth 
what's been shared with me with some of the people on the show is that we're going to get some um are you, I, I have this I have this saying sledgehammer moments you know I say I get these sledgehammer moments when I ask for something and I don't um, do it and then life hits me over the head with a sledgehammer and says wake up <laughs> so I think that humanity is in for some sledgehammer moments actually to sort of wake us up to more unity and uh, I think we're already having one with President Trump so. <laughs> he's definitely one of the sledgehammers. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> What's your perspective on Trump? I know you've got a perspective. Well, I, I think, and, and I have not researched this as just an educated guess, that he's playing a role that was scripted for him before we were born, and which many, many of us asked him to play. You know, at the level of the personality, we uh, glorify and heroify and also vilify certain roles. So he's in a role that is widely vilified, but from the perspective on the other side, there is no judgment like that. All of these roles are seen as valuable and important and necessary. Uh, and I think, as you said, he's probably one of the sledgehammers. <laughs> but uh, so his, his, um, his ideas on women and feminine power have, uh, I think I heard you say in another interview, have, uh, there's more women now running for Congress and, like it's it's making women stand up and have more of a voice because he seems to be sort of, you know, creating, like talking about the opposite. So women are sort of standing up to sort of try and offset his rhetoric around, um, you know, yes. women are and, supposed and to be moving forward. That's already happened here in yeah. the US. We had more women run for Congress than ever before. Uh, more were elected than ever before. And uh, the House of Representatives here in the U.S. now has more women and younger women than any previous class of representatives. So it's, it's moved yeah. in that direction already. So he's playing his role to perfection, really. He's doing, I think he is. Yeah, he's doing a good job. We have to give him an Academy Award. <laughs> <laughs> I think we, as, as much as people don't like him now, uh, I think those same people will be thanking him profusely when we all get back to the other side. Yeah. Well, exactly. Yeah. You know, there's a great old movie that had a remake with Keanu Reeves called The Day the Earth Stood Still. It was on television the other night. Funnily enough, when I was down staying with my brother over the weekend, I was racking my brain. To, you know that movie? What's the name of it? What's the name of it? And I switch on the television last night and there it is. It's like, oh, hello. Thank you. But the the premise in this movie is that the aliens have come to earth to wipe humanity off the planet because they're a cancer to the planet and they're killing her. And so I think he says, you know, I've come to save the earth. And then when the, the, the heroine in the movie says, I thought you said you came to save the earth. He said, yes, I've come to save the earth, but that means I've got to kill all the humans to save the earth. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> have you seen the movie? I have not seen that movie. It's made in the 30s or 50s and then made again probably in the early 2000s. Uh, and the, the, he goes and speaks to a scientist, a, a philosopher who says, you know, don't kill us off yet. It's when humanity is, is pressed, is, is, moves to the precipice that they change. It's like it's only when we move to the brink of life and death do we change. And I remember hearing that many years ago, thinking, that's not true. We can change without being pressed, you know, without being like life or death. We can change just because we want to change. And now a few years later, I think as I watch the majority of humanity, I think actually maybe they were right in that movie. Maybe we have to move to the brink of disaster before we do change our pollutive ways or what do you think about that? Bob? I, I think there's some truth to that. I, I mean, certainly if people could change their ways easily, then Trump would never have been called into the role that he's in now. It would never have been right. necessary. So right. we, we do need some of those sledgehammers. <laughs> a few more sledgehammer moments to come. But when we move to a new earth or a new shift or a shift in dimension, the challenges in the third dimension have, we, we put all these challenges in place in order to expand and grow. But then as we shift, I think I've heard you say, we don't need the contrast or the polarity. We don't need the trauma in order to learn that we can learn just because we want to learn. We can grow just because we want to grow. Like we can. I, I, 
I certainly believe that that's possible. The Buddha supposedly said that you can learn anything you want to learn through joyful experiences. And I believe that that is true at a certain level of consciousness, but you have to get to that level of consciousness first. Right. Yeah. So we don't need to plan in all with disasters. We can learn through joy and, and um, yeah, just, just like you learn at university through reading and applying what you read. I hope that these shows, you know, and the books, I hope that your books and my books, that people learn through reading and seeing other people's experiences and they don't have to go through their own dramas, that they can just change because they choose to change rather than having the sledgehammer moments. <laughs> is that what yeah, you Yeah, you know, that is what I hope. And, and it really is very simple because if you simply ask yourself, what would love do? now every time you have to make a choice and then you do whatever the answer to that question is that then you won't need a lot of the challenges that have been planned as potentials in your life blueprint absolutely what would love do now what would love do now yeah absolutely rob schwartz it's been just so beautiful thank you so much for being on the show do you want to leave is there a pearl that you want to leave our listeners with before we go well, the thought I would leave people with is, uh, as I understand it, Earth is literally the most difficult place in our universe on which to have an incarnation. Uh, and only the most courageous of beings come here. There are many, many beings who know there would be value in coming here. They don't have the courage to do that. The fact that you are in a body on planet Earth at this time makes you automatically among the most courageous beings in the universe. So honor yourself for having the courage to be here. Love yourself for the courageous being who you really and truly are. Beautiful. Thank you so much. You're welcome. A pleasure. Fabulous show with Rob Schwartz. Fascinating, isn't it? I wonder how this has affected your life. How can you see that the challenges that you've experienced, maybe you planned them. When I talk about us being genius creators, we're genius creators, not from this linear personality perspective, but we're creating from our soul's perspective. And um, so, yeah, we have to look at life in a way that take on that radical responsibility that maybe there, I have created this situation for a reason. He talks about, we didn't go into it. I could have talked to Rob all day, actually. He talks about abusive relationships, how a lot of souls plan to come into abusive marriages and relationships to foster more compassion and all sorts of reasons why we choose the challenges that we choose. But I, um, I, I'm sure all of us look forward to a day <laughs> where we can learn from joy instead of from the contrast. It's very much been a third dimensional experience to learn to create contrast, to create drama and problems in order to have experiences, in order to grow and learn and remember love, return to love, to set up situations where no love appears to be there, either in relationships or in situations, and then to find the love within, even though you're not experiencing it outside your, yourself. You know, can you find that love inside? because it's not out there, it's in here. And when you find it in here, then you bring it to the world. Spread the love, spread the love. That's why you're here. You're here to spread the love. And uh, maybe you've put yourself in those traumatic situations, maybe work experiences or personal relationships or family experiences to bring love where there is no love. You are the one we've been waiting for. You bring the love, you bring the knowledge. You bring the wisdom. You're the ones that are shifting this world. It's up to you. So can we look at all of it with gratitude? Can we be grateful for the Trumps, the presidents, <laughs> for the, the drama and the uh, contrast that we experience? That's very much what we've chosen to do while we're here. And then as we shift into a new dimension, we will experience growth and uh, expansion in a more harmonious, more joyous way. I think we've spoken about on either the, in, the Inner Sanctum or a show, somebody said, uh, oh, yeah, it was in the Inner Sanctum. That's right. Courtney had asked Garnet. It was with Garnet. You know, what, 
if you move to the new earth and there's no disease or you know money problems or hatred no negative emotions you know what are we learning if there's if there's no contrast and my guides have said oh there's so much to learn there's so much to learn but we don't have to learn through the drama we can learn through just wanting to learn through a curious mind having a curious mind and wanting to know so the lessons that we have are like the lessons that we have when we're at university or school you know how can I create that when it seems impossible I can find a way so there's, there's so much to learn and expand and we don't have to create the drama but if there is drama in your life bless it love it and you'll get the lesson from it be grateful for it and then you can move to a place where joy is your default setting <laughs> like me I live in joy absolute joy so thanks again for listening and watching to another show accentuating the positive and remember to like and subscribe and leave your comments and uh, join our inner sanctum if you want to have this conversation with a little intimate group and talk about all this stuff this is what we talk about I love it I love it online each month a couple of times a few times a month and then I invite a guest teacher to come I have to invite Rob actually. I'm booked out for guest teachers this year, but maybe next year I'll invite Rob in and we can pump him full of questions. Maybe we've got some questions for him. Uh, as I said on the last show, Rich Martini is coming up this month in the Inner Sanctum. So, hacking the afterlife. If you've got questions about the afterlife, you can uh, hack Rich Martini <laughs> in the Inner Sanctum. He's fabulous, he's such a joy. And uh, yeah, remember to buy the book Awakened by Death. As I said to Rob, by reading the books and watching the shows and listening to how other people overcame their challenges, we can learn like that. We don't have to actually create our own challenges to learn. We can learn from how other people overcame their challenges. And so hopefully these uh, book series that I put out, the books I put out and the shows that I put out and the online sessions that I do are helping people evolve and learn and return to love without having to go through the dramas or even fulfill their life plan so maybe they've put in plan all these traumatic things and once you've learned the lesson you don't have to go through it you can lead a life of love and joy and ease and grace and be the genius deliberate creators that you came here to be <laughs> because this is who you are you are a genius creator a genius can you be a genius deliberate creator once you lead your life with love then you're being deliberate in flowing your energy Love you all. Bye for now. Mwah.